called change, okay? So let's stand together. We're going to pray. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to do the work. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to be the teacher because He is the teacher. And when the Holy Spirit, when He comes, he, the Word of God says He will lead us and He will guide us into all truth. And then we understand this. When you know the truth, the truth will make you what? Free. Free. <coughs> We're on our way to freedom. And whom the Son makes free, He is free indeed. There's something about understanding where God is taking us. So let's ask the Holy Spirit right now to lead us, to teach us, to direct us, and let's let that fire burn in our soul. Father, we thank you we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your presence. We thank you, Lord, for the revelation of your mercy and your grace that you have given to us. So, Lord, we surrender today. We surrender our thoughts. We surrender our feelings. We surrender our emotions. We surrender everything to you. And, Lord, we just say, simply say, Lord, whatever you want to do in me, I'm willing to let you do it. Yes, Lord, I'm willing. I'm willing, Lord. Whatever you want to do to me, Lord, I'm, le I'm ready and willing to let you do it to me. And whatever you want to do through me, Lord, I'm ready to let you do it through me. And Father, I just want to say thank you because I believe you have a will and you have a plan for every one of us. And it's your will that's in heaven. Let your will in heaven be done to us, through us today. Let these earthen vessels experience your treasure. Let these earthen vessels experience your glory. Let, let these earthen vessels experience your will in heaven being done in earth today so that we may know you for who you really are. We may experience you and you may change us. So we surrender to your will, Lord, right now. Everybody say these words. Say, Heavenly Father, I lay myself before you. I ask you to cut me open and remove from me everything that's not pleasing to you. Speak to my heart. Change my life. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Wow. Well, praise the Lord. All right, you can be seated. I want you to know that God is up to something and it's, it's something very good. The most difficult thing that any individual can ever do is change. Amen. And if we try to change on our own, we have discovered it just doesn't work. Amen. There's so many people that want to overcome things. The people in the world and many people in the church that, that have things they need to overcome. And so we start searching, we start looking for answers, we start trying to find people that can help us overcome. And what we're trying to overcome mainly is ourselves and our bad habits and our, 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 the things that we are doing that we know are wrong and we, we keep doing them anyway. You know, we talked about that a little bit in the last uh, couple of messages on this, in this series. Paul dealt with what it was like before he met Jesus. The things he knew were right, he just didn't do. And so we, we go through these experiences and we try to change and so what we do in the world, the natural thing to do is to go to a counselor. And so we do, we go to a counselor and we tell them what all of our problems are and then they tell us, uh, they agree with us, and then they tell us what we need to do to fix it. And usually after a few sessions at a counselor, we stop going because they are agreeing with how bad we are. And then when they tell us what we need to do to fix it, the answer is always change. I don't want to change. I just want to go to a counselor. I want to go and tell him everything that's wrong with everybody else and why I am the way I am, the way God made me this way. God did. It's God's fault. I'm this way because God made me this way. And so we tell the counselor what all these things that are wrong with us. And then he may give us, if he's a Christian counselor, he'll give you the word. 
And then when the word comes, we say, no, I don't, that's not what I need. I need somebody to agree with me that it's everybody else's fault. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And so we, we quit going to a counselor. And so we can't, we're going through these issues in our life and we try to get help. We try to get freedom from our addictions and freedom from our problems. And so we go to, to, to uh, uh, group therapy and we get involved with other people that are going through the same thing. And, and then we talk with one another. We share with one another. We can relate with them. And, and, and that's all good because we need that support group, you know. But if that support group does not lead you to the word, there will never be any change. Because a lot of times support groups become pity parties where we just feel sorry for one another. Yeah. yeah. And that's what we really like in the church. We want everybody to just feel sorry for us. We want, and we want to tell everybody our problems and say, man, you know, uh, it's, it's bad and we want somebody to cry with us. We, and the result of that is there's no change. We're still f slaves. We're still not free. We're still in bondage. There's an answer that brings freedom, and it is a process that is called change. Everybody just say change. change. Now then, if you are not willing to change, a counselor will not help you. A group therapy session will not help you. Hearing the word will not help you. Saying Jesus three times will not help you. If you're not willing to change, then there is no future that is better than your past. That's true. This is going to be the most difficult part in this series. I want you to, I want you to be prepared, but I want you to hear it because the Holy Spirit is doing a work in us. And we have to reach that point where we have to acknowledge the fact that I cannot change on my own. The only change that is permanent is what the Lord Jesus Christ can do in me when I'm willing to let him purify me. When I'm willing to let him cleanse me. When I'm willing to let him change me. Because change does not come from the outside in. It comes from the inside out. It's not just physical habits that you can change. It is before you can change the physical habits, you have to have a different mindset. You have to have a different way of thinking that causes the physical man to do different. And a lot of people can do that. I mean, there's some programs we can go through. You know, we can make up our mind. You know, we can go through all of our diet things. We can lose our weight and, and then uh, we gain it back. And then we lose it again and we gain it back because it's, there's got to be a mindset that changes, but it needs to become something permanent. I've got some good news for you. God has the ability to change your mind by the power of his spirit. But before you can change your mind to think differently, you must be willing to let him change your spirit. Because it, is, because it is by the Holy Spirit that he equips you with his ability to do what he's called you to do. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Romans chapter 12, verse number 1. I love this because this is, this is some of my favorite scriptures I'm going to be sharing today. Some of the most important life-changing scriptures that you will hear. Because this is actually what the Christian walk is all about. It's a life of freedom. It is a path to freedom. It is a lifestyle that says, I'm never going to go back to the slavery I was in. It's a lifestyle that says, I've learned my lesson in that experience, and I'll never do that again. It's a lifestyle that says, Tomorrow, to, this morning is a brand new morning because his loving kindness and tender mercies are brand new to me today. So I'm not going to nail Jesus to the cross again today by doing what I did wrong yesterday. I'm free from that. That's right. Amen? Yeah. So, the whole New Testament is the gospel. The whole New Testament is the message of freedom from the power of sin. Freedom from the control of sin. Freedom from slavery. 
And that's the path we're on. We've talked to you a little bit about the children of Israel leaving Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, going through the wilderness, going across the River of Jordan, and going into the Promised Land. The Promised Land was the place of freedom. But in the place of freedom, there were battles to fight, there were wars to win, there were, there were giants to overcome, there were things to experience. Right? So before we go further, I want you to hear this. Our life is made up of events. Our life is made up of moments. If you'll remember your past, you just go through. You can, your memory, you can, you can be flooded with memories. You can go down memory lane. We did it a little bit this week. We go with memory lane. You remember all these experiences. And then you remember one event, and that sparks another memory. You remember another event, and that sparks another memory. And you can just spend hours talking about all the good memories and maybe some of the bad memories of your life and, and just get caught up in that. And that's fun from time to time, but you don't want to live there. Yeah. Family reunions are fun. Because you get together and you talk about all your past experiences. And when you leave and you drive off, you, you say, I hope I can forget most of those things we talked about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But memories are okay. But they, the mem reason those memories are there is because you have had events in your past. Yes. You have had markers in your life where things have happened, whether they be good or they be bad. They've happened to you and they are your memories. Yes. But here's the thing that's going to be different now. We're wanting to change. So what the Lord has given us is events, but they are now in our future. God wants to give you today an event for you to look forward to in your future. Now, we can do that in the natural. You know, we have events. We have things that we plan. We have things that we look forward to from time to time. And, well, you know, some of those of you that are going to go on this cruise, you're looking forward to that. That's going to be a lot of fun. There's going to be about 44 of us or more, or, I don't know, 46 of us that are going. And, and it's going to be a, a, a fun time. It's going to be a relaxing time, enjoyable time. But it's going to be a time of ministry. It's going to be a time of worship. It's going to be a time of the Word. It's going to be a time of coming together and getting acquainted with one another and getting acquainted with God in a better way because you're going to see Him in a different way because of your location and your separation from the stuff of life. It's going to be a good time. But that's an event in our future. We're looking forward to it. Some of you have that app on your phone where you do the countdown days to the next event. Yeah. yeah. We look forward to missions trips. You know, we plan something. We plan a trip to go somewhere in the world and we, and, and we make plans toward that. And it's an event in our future that we plan towards, that we look forward to. And we spend the excitement of our future event begins when we plan it. Because it's not just about the destiny, it's about the journey. Your expectation, you're looking forward. Sometimes the planning and the excitement and looking forward to an experience is, takes so much longer and there's so much more joy, joy involved in the planning than it is the event itself. Because yeah. you're just excited about something different. We look forward to changes in our future. Some of you wake up in the morning and you don't have anything planned. And when you don't have anything planned, you don't have an event to look forward to. Uh, yeah, I know that hurt. It's true. I know I, I'm, just, I'm just a motivated person. I've always got something that I've got to do, something to look forward to, something that's got to happen, something that, that I have to be involved in. There's always something there. And if I ever reach that point where I just don't have anything scheduled for the next few minutes, I think, well, what am I going to do now? Well, bring a cup of coffee. <laughs> Take a break. But our lifestyle is so uh, geared toward planning for something continually in our future. You know what? And that's a good thing because that future event is something that gives us a hope. It gives us a motivation. It gives us a, a drive to continue to keep on keeping on. Some of you, the greatest event of your life is Sunday morning church. Amen. And it ought to be. The greatest event of your life ought to be hearing the word, fellowshipping with believers, and worshiping God together as one unit. That's just the greatest event. Because everything else is just nothing compared to being a part of the body of Christ, being built up and edified together. 
And those are events, you know. I, I, I don't know. We're just missing a service on Sunday. It's just almost uh, uh, out of the question because I, that drive is there. It's not because I'm preaching, but because I just like to be with God's people in God's presence and hearing the word, receiving the word. Being an obedient servant. But... What happens now, we, sometimes we plan an event in our future that requires us to change before we can accomplish that event. That event. An example with that would be if you're, if you're involved in sports and you're going to be playing a big game, you've got to prepare your body, you've got to prepare yourself. If you're going to run uh, uh, some type of marathon, you've got to prepare your body. You know, our middle son, that's what he does. He, he does those marathon things and he, and he prepares for years for one race. What is wrong with him? He loses all this weight, eats these certain things, never goes to a fast food restaurant, never eats any fast. Can you imagine living your life without eating any fast food? Wow. Doesn't eat sugar, eats all this healthy stuff and gets out and runs miles and miles and miles. When he came and ministered here one time, he went out the morning in the morning in the rain and ran 13 miles before he did anything else, you know? And I'm tired right now. <laughs> but what he was doing, he is, was planning for a future event. And before he could accomplish that, whatever race it was, I think it was like a 15-mile marathon he was going to be running. Before he could accomplish that race, he had to change. I want to win the race, but I don't want to change. <laughs> Yeah. Are y'all getting this now, aren't you? So we're finding out now that before we can accomplish the events that God has set in our future, there may be some change required on our part. I know you wanted one of those ding-dong sermons where you could just feel good and go home. No. Or dinky-twinky sermons. No. This is, this is the kind of word that if we hear it, we are going to be prepared for what God has in our future. Amen. So let's read this scripture. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, we really like to read over that part real fast. My body, this body, a living sacrifice. That means a body that we're willing to make do what is right for the glory of God. All right? I know you're saying, please go on to the next point. Present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, here's, here's the verse, verse 2. And be not conformed... To this world. Amen. It's so easy to fit into the mold that the world makes. It's just so easy just to blend in and look like the world, act like the world, talk like the world. It's easy to be conformed to the world. Is he? It's just the easiest thing we can do because that doesn't require us to change for the glory of God. It just requires us to go back to our natural way of doing things because that's the way the world lives. The world lives naturally. All right? Be not conformed to this world. But he says, instead of doing that, do this. Instead of being conformed to the world... Instead of doing that, do this. Be transformed. Amen. Yeah. And how are we going to be transformed? We're going to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Amen. All right. Now, we understand. You've heard this, and you need to hear it again. This is the only thing that can change your mind. If your mind is not changed by this, it's not changed properly. Amen. All right? So he said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This word says, 
let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What kind of a mind did Jesus have? He had the mind to do the will of the Father 100% of the time. Even though his emotions and his feelings and his physical body did not want to obey. Have you know that? He did not want to go to the cross. Have you ever read the, his experience in the garden when he talked to daddy and he said, dad, if there's any other way we can make this happen, let's do it another way. I don't want to go through this. Amen. But he did not allow his feelings, his emotions, and his physical body to direct his decision. There's a lesson. Let that mind be in you. For you don't allow your feelings and emotions and your physical being to direct your decision that you make. Because what did Jesus have? He had the mind of the Father. Let this mind be in you which was in Jesus. When you have the mind of God, you have wisdom, you have understanding. And so now then, the only way we can get the mind of God and the mind of Christ is to hear the word. He said, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And when you get your mind renewed to be like his mind, there's only one, one way of thinking, and that is the word way. That is the Bible way. That is the Jesus way. That is the right way. It is the righteous way. Yes. All right? We're going to get to freedom. He said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. You see, if you're looking for proof, you don't have your mind renewed. Once you get your mind renewed, you prove. You prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. God. You're not always chasing after his will, trying to get a, a, an idea. What is it God wants me to do? What is it I'm supposed to be doing? No, you know his will because your mind's renewed to his will. Now then that doesn't happen just by memorizing scriptures. It happens by being in love with him because of his love for you. When you fall in love with him, the result of that is you desire to know him. And so the way you get to know him is you spend time with him. The way you spend time with him is by hearing and receiving the word. When you take hold of the word of God, you take hold of the will of God. You know the good, acceptable, and perfect. Everybody say good, good. Acceptable, acceptable, perfect. perfect. And we've got, we've got to realize that's not three different wills. It's one will. It's good, acceptable, and perfect. Everybody say, God's will is good. God's will is acceptable. And God's will is perfect. All right. Now, when we get into that, we get understanding that that's the place, that's the event in your future that God wants you to arrive at, where you can walk in His will. Because in his will, there is an open heaven over you. In his will is a place where blessings will run over you. In his will is a lifestyle of yes, overcoming Warring, going through trials, going through battles, but being victorious in every single experience. Yes. That's his will. Yes. That's the event for your future that God desires all of us to live in. And the way we get there is by getting the word of God in us because we know faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word. All right, so on this path now that we're going, this road to freedom is going to require something. The purpose of, of what happened when the children of Israel went to the wilderness, the wilderness was the purifying experience. The 40 weeks or 40 days it should have been, but it was 40 years 
40 is the process of purification. It is the process of preparation. Jesus was in the wilderness himself for 40 days after he was baptized in water and the Holy Spirit. The Spirit led him into the wilderness. Why? So that he could be tempted and tested and tried. The wilderness is for preparation for your victorious lifestyle. But the purpose of the wilderness was to change the children of Israel so that when they got to the river of Jordan, they were prepared to go in. Yeah, I don't like that change part. This is the road. And we understand, we heard, you heard what we talk about last time about the fact that they, they didn't go straight in. They were led around because the enemy that was there would have destroyed them. And, and God knew that they were not quite prepared for battle. They might want to go back to Egypt if they saw that big problem. So it led them another way and took a little bit longer. And when they got there, they still got there and they still weren't big enough or strong enough in their faith because even though they had the word of the Lord, they did not believe the word of the Lord. When they got to the promised land, they said the giants are big. God's we're like grasshoppers in our own eyes. That's what they say. In our own eyes, we're like grasshoppers. There was their problem. They didn't know how big God was. Because they didn't know how big they could be in the eyes of God. So they went back. What happened? They did not change. Hold on now. You cannot win your next battle unless you are willing to change. There are so many people that go through the same problem over and 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 over because they cannot learn or do not want to learn what they need to learn. They're not willing to change. You cannot go to the seventh grade until you graduate and pass the test in the sixth. We've got a lot of sixth graders that have been in the sixth grade for 40 years. Because we don't want to change. And then we wonder why. Why am I going through this? Why, why am I going around this mountain again? I've been here before. Deja vu. I mean, I've been in this problem. I've gone through this experience. I've had this issue before and I got it again. This is the way God made me. Yeah, that's what we say, isn't it? No, God can't. God loves you so much, He will not let you go through that next battle until you are able to win in this battle. Because the next giant will kill you. And this battle you're in right now is just a training session. Yeah. Do you love the Lord? All right, here's the thing. You know, change is so scary because that means we're going to move out of our comfort zone. That means we're going to, we're going to have to be, tomorrow morning when I get up, I'm going to have to do something different than I did this morning. Tomorrow I'm going to have to be someone different than I was today. It's called change. All right. So we're going to look at what happens in this process. There are steps involved. There's some things that need to happen so that we can change. Is We've got to be willing to let God do what he needs to do in us, to us, and through us. Because we have some situations in us that must change. And one of them is uh, we need healing. How many of you need healing in your physical body? Raise your hand. Amen. How many of you need healing in your, emotion, in your emotions? Raise your hand. How many of you need healing from just from past experiences? Raise your hand. All right, what is it? We understand that there's a process now where we need to change. Because the reason for healing is that means something is out of order. Y'all going to love me when this is over? So there's a process now involved to receive that emotional healing, that physical healing, and that spiritual healing. Step number one. It's called the reality step. Write it down. The reality step. Before you can ever go forward to the event that God has planned for your future, you've got to accept the reality of where you are. 
first thing you need to realize is that you're not God. See, many of us, we approach God and we tell God how to fix our problems. And it's never by changing me. It's always fixing that person that messed me up. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> Reality step number one, realize that you're not God and then admit that you are powerless to control your desires to do your own thing your desires to do the wrong thing and understand that you are powerless to, to control those things in your life that happen around you that are out of your grasp. It's not up to you. Before you can go forward, you've got to realize that every change is going to have to happen because you are willing to let God make the change in you. Because it is God's power that empowers you to do those things that are different. That's right. Can't do it on your own. You're powerless. Now I'm talking about those that do not have, those that have not yielded to God. I'm talking about those that are just going through the same battle over and over and over again. We're not accepting the plan of God. The children of Israel in the wilderness, the word of God says that the word was given to them. The same word that we've heard was given to them. Yeah. But they did not mix faith with that word by obeying. That's it. Yeah. Because you see, the display of faith is the work. It is the obedience. Yeah. So you, don't, you cannot obey something you don't believe. Okay. But when you hear the word and you do the word, what are you, what are you doing? You are empowering the Holy Spirit to work through you. The act of obedience is the power of God. Yeah, all right, let's go a little further. The next step we've got to understand is, it's called the hope step. We've got reality. We realize that it's messed up. I'm messed up. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have a clue. But God. That scripture in Corinthians where Paul writes, he says, there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. That means everybody's got stuff. Everybody goes through things. Everybody has a temptation, a test, and a trial. It's common to man. Everybody say, my problem, my problem. is like everybody else's problem. Oh, no. They can't, nobody can have a problem as bad as me. Yeah, they can. It's the world we live in. But the scripture goes on to say, but God is faithful. And he will, with that temptation, that test, that trial, that problem, he will show you the way, you the way to escape. Yes. That you may be able to bear up under it and cast it off. What's going to happen in that problem, you're going to grow. In that problem, you're going to experience change. Because now then, if you turn your eyes off of yourself and you look to him, he places something inside of you called hope. When you choose to believe the word of God, you have hope for tomorrow. When you choose to believe the word of God, you have hope for an answer. When you choose to believe the word of God, you have something that says inside of me, I know that the event in my future is going to be better than the event in my present. Yes. Yes, yes. And we sang that song today about the hope is the anchor. Do you understand? Hope is the anchor of your soul, yes. your mind, your will, your emotions. And if you have that hope in you, it's called Christ in you, the hope of glory. In the midst of the storm, you have an anchor that's going to see you through the storm and when the storm passes over and the clouds are no more, do you understand that there's going to be a clear sky, there's going to be calm waters, and the event of your future will be better than the event of your past because you had hope for tomorrow. Yes. Before you can have hope, you've got to believe the Word. There you go. Before you have hope, you've got to believe in God. Before you can have hope, you've got to believe that God loved you so much he gave his only son for you. Before you can have hope, you've got to believe that God exists. 
Before you have hope, you've got to believe that His Word is real, that it's for you today, that it's not just a history book. Before you can have hope, you've got to believe in His power that He's given to you because of His Word. Do you understand that when you believe those things, then your hope is set? Yes. <laughs> Once you believe the Word, it doesn't matter about the storm anymore. Once you believe the word, it doesn't matter about the wind. It doesn't matter about the problems. Why? Because I have something in me called hope. When this is over, it's going to be better than it was. Yes. It's called hope. Yes. Yeah. Accept that you're powerless and then put your hope in God. Amen. We're on our way to freedom now. Here's the next step we've got to deal with, and that's that control step. I believe we heard a little bit about that already. The Lord just prepared this, prepared you for this message. Control. We need that fire that burns out of control in us. Amen. You see, we always want there to be a move of God that doesn't get out of hand. We want there to be a... We want everything to be in our little time frame and we want to put God in our box and we want to use Him when we need Him in our situations and then, and then we don't want to, Him to bother us when we're doing our own thing. We want to control. That's what religion does. Religion controls people. Do it my way or hit the highway. We can control people. That's not the kingdom of God. He's the one in control, and then we surrender our control to Him. Yes. Not to man, to Him. And when we let go of the controls, we find out He can fly the plane a whole lot better than us. Yes, amen. Yes, yes. Because when the storm comes, if you don't have faith, you will judge your flying by what you see in the storm instead of what the controls are saying. You have to let go of your own feelings, your own thought processes, the way that you would do things naturally, and you have to trust. Wow. If you'll make that step to let go and let God, you are preparing for that change. This is the change process. Hope is coming. Now then my hope for my future is better than what I have today and what I've experienced in my past. So now then before I can experience that hope event for my future, I've got to say, okay, Lord, I can't do this, but you can. Yes. Amen. And he's going to move into you and he's going to say, okay, I can. And because I can, now you can. You see, when you were trying to do it yourself, you couldn't. But when you yield it to him, now then you can say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. So now then what he's doing, he is empowering you with his ability. Yes. This is no longer your ability. Right. He is empowering you with his ability to do what needs to be done. It's called grace, the God-given ability to overcome. He will empower you with his ability. Now then, why, how, how can I be empowered with his ability? I let go of my control. Yes. I let him control me. And now then, because he is leading me, he is guiding me, and I'm willing to follow him, I'm not going around that mountain ever again. I'm going on to another one. I'm not going to face that giant ever again because he's dead. I'm going on to another one. Because I have let go of control and I am willing to change and I'm willing to I'll let the Lord change me so I can be what he's called me to be. Yes. Wow. Good. The next step we're going to look at is the examination. <laughs> let a man examine himself. Wow. You know, this is the process of, of living a lifestyle of Christianity. This is what we call sanctification. It's a continual process of being willing to change. It's a continual process of hearing the word and saying, oh, wow. Forgive me, Lord. 
I won't do it that way again. I'll do it your way. See, every time we dig into the Word, every time we hear the Word, see, a lot of people, they just read the Word to get a message to give to somebody else. <laughs> Pastors have that problem. Amen. I'm just getting this message because I know so-and-so is going to be there Sunday and they need to hear this. Yeah. No, that's not the way you do it. The Word of God, no matter what we, how we receive it, is for us. If we don't receive it and live in obedience to it, we have no authority to give it. Because the power that you give it with is only natural. It's man. But if you live in it with the revelation of it working in you, then when you give it, it doesn't just reach the brain. It reaches the spirit. Yes. Yes. Amen. That's the lifestyle of a believer. Now, so what we do, we must examine ourselves in light of the word continually. If there be anything out of order in our life, the purpose of the word is for the Lord to reveal that word to us, us and bishop our soul with that word so that we can bring our soul in line with his word so we can be transformed by the renewing of our mind and then we can be what God's called us to be. Why? Because there's something in my future that I want to do that God has planned for me that's much bigger and better than anything I've ever known in my past and I need to be prepared for the event. All right, I've got to go on. The next step is called the submission step. Hmm. This is where we make a decision voluntarily to submit to everything God speaks to us in His Word. Not just the parts that make us feel good or that we already agree with. It's so easy to take some of these things and just read over them real quick and get to the part that we like. But if all of it is inspired, then all of it is a revelation for us to walk in. Yes. Now I'm not talking about the law, I'm talking about Gospel. I'm talking about a New Testament lifestyle of obedience that empowers us to raise the dead, to lay hands on the sick, to cast out demons, to speak with new tongues, and not let anything in the world affect us. That's a lifestyle. And when we make this decision to surrender and to submit everything to Him, what we are doing, we are really, we're, we're willingly saying, Lord, you can live through me. It's no longer I that lives, but it's Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave himself for me. So whatever I do, it's not me. That's it. That's it. Why? Because I'm submitted. I am a person under his authority. And I say what he says, I see what he sees, and I do what he tells me. That's the lifestyle of a born-again believer living in the anointing. Because you see, the anointing doesn't come just because somebody laid their hands on you. The anointing comes because you're living in obedience to the Word. Yes. You can say amen now. Yes. Now here's a problem. We talk about our character. Now when we get into the understanding of our character, we say, well, this is just the, God, the way God made me. When you say that, you, are, you, need to, you need to let a red flag come up right in front of your face and say, no. If you're living in disobedience to the word, God didn't make you this way. Sin made you that way. Yeah. So where does my character defects come from? All these things that are wrong in me. Where do they come from? Well, my chromosomes. I mean, this is just part of nature. This is the way I was born. This is what we use for an excuse. I was just born this way. This is my makeup. My daddy was like this. My mama was like this. My uncle was like this. My great-grandpa was like this. It just runs in our family. You, know, you have some good, good traits that run through your family. That's good. You need, to, you need to take on the good and kick out the bad. And stop saying, this is just the way God made me. God did not make us to be disobedient to his word. 
sin nature that we were born into. That's the natural way of doing things. That is what made us that way, to be disobedient. But when you get born again, you no longer have that nature. You now take on the nature of Christ because the Word says you are now a new creation in Christ. Another thing that we say develops our character is our circumstances. My defects, I'm this way because of the way I was raised. And that's probably true. Because if you were raised to be an unbeliever and a, and a whoremonger and a drunkard, and that's what the lifestyle you've gotten used to, that's, what, that's the character you develop and that's the things you begin to do. And so now then your excuse is because this is, I'm this way because this is what, the way I was trained to be. That's all true in the natural. But when you get born again, you don't live by the natural way of doing things anymore. When you get born again, you are now a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. All things are made new. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Character defects often are often attempts that we have to feel unmet needs that we have. I'm doing this because I need this. I'm acting this way because I need this. And you know, you understand all these things so far, it's all about me, right? My character is because this is what I want. Another thing that develops our character is our choices. <laughs> Over a period of time, do you understand that you are who you are because of the choices that you've made in your past? I, heard, I, I, I uh, learned one time many, many years ago that every person is simply a product. We are a product of our past. We are a product of everything that we've seen, everything that we've heard, every book that we've read, everything that we have watched on TV, everything that we've watched on the internet, and every, every conversation we've been in, and every action that we have committed in our past, we are now a sum total, a product of all of our past experiences. Amen. And that's true in the natural. But don't believe that to the point that says you are that because of that. You are a new creature in Christ. Amen. What we're talking about, we're talking about the path to freedom. The path to freedom is an experience called change. I'm no longer going to be that. I'm no longer going to do that because I am no longer that. I'm a new person. That man is dead. I made wrong choices in the past, but I'm not making those wrong choices in the present because I'm a new creation in Christ. Sometimes our character defects are simply positive qualities that we have that are being misused. But we don't know how to direct them in the right direction and discipline. You see, discipline is the key to a godly character. That's why he called 12 losers. Jesus called 12 losers to follow him. You may say, well, I can't help it. This is the way I was, all way I've always been, you know, and I'm just a loser. I don't deserve God, don't deserve the anointing. I don't deserve anything because I did all this. I want you to know something. Jesus, when he began to call his disciples, he found the losers. Amen. He called three fishermen that couldn't catch fish. Amen. And he called them. See, God, when he calls you, he doesn't care how big of a loser you are. He doesn't care about your past. It doesn't matter what you've done. If he calls you, he will qualify you. And what's he going to qualify you for a future event that's better than you've, anything you've ever known in your past? So now then you can make right choices. So don't blame your bad character on all your stuff in the past, even though you, may, you need to understand that you have some things, positive things in you, you may be misusing them. So God's saying, I want you to take those things that are in you, and I want to discipline you. That's why he called the disciples, disciples. Anybody know what disciple means? Raise your hand if you know. Raise your hand if you don't know. Let me tell you. 
Disciple means disciplined one. You mean to tell me he called Peter his disciple? You see, Jesus knows how to live by faith. Do you understand that when he called Peter, James, and John, he was calling them disciples by faith. You are my disciples. Because he knew the end from the beginning. He was calling those things that be not as though they were. And see, this is the way the kingdom of God increases. When you begin to see people the way God sees them, instead of seeing people the way religion sees them. You see people the way God sees them instead of seeing them the way your natural man sees them. God's plan is for everyone to be born again. That's His will. He's not one that any should, repent, would, should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's will. And when we begin to see God's will, we find out those people that we have been judging because they don't do it the way we do it, we find out that God's will is that they be saved. So we need to love them like God loves them instead of loving them like man loves them. They have some stuff that's being misused, misguided because they don't know Jesus. And if, you, if they don't see Jesus in you, they may never see Jesus. All right, I've got to continue. I've got to go a little bit further. Will y'all let me go about five more minutes? Come on. I knew you would. All right, let's go. Let's look at this. Why is it so hard to change all those characteristics that are bad? Let me give you the excuse. Number one, I've had them too long. <laughs> Number two, I identify with them. Yeah, I identify with these. Oh, it's just me. It's just me to be. Fill in the blank. It's me to be ugly. It's me to be bitter. It's just me to be loud. It's just me to be boisterous. It's just me to be a thief. It's just me to be an adulterer. It's just me. It's just me. Just me. It's just me. Either love me like I am, accept me like I am, or just don't be with me. It's just me. God doesn't want us to be me. He wants us to be Him. And if those things that are just me are not like Him, we need to be willing to change. Amen. And so we ask the question, if I let go of this defect, and am I still going to be me? Let's hope not. Amen. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Father. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Let's go back to Romans 12, and I'm going to close. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says this. I beseech you. I implore you. I'm begging of you. I beseech you. I implore you. I am begging of you, pay attention to me, brethren. By the mercies of God. <laughs> yeah. Now, what Paul was saying is that you can't do this on your own. But I'm begging you to do it anyway. You don't have the ability to do this, but I am pleading with you to do it anyway. Paul, are you out of your mind? Yeah, he's out of his mind. And he said, I want you to be out of your mind too. Amen. He says, by the mercies of God, I'm pleading with you that you present your body a living sacrifice. In other words, bring yourself under control. Become a discipline. Become a disciple, a disciplined one. I wish they had a band playing right now. That would be awesome. <laughs> A disciplined one. A living sacrifice. Now look at this. He wants our bodies to be living sacrifice. Yes. Amen. Living sacrifice. That means living disciplined. Living under subjection to the will of God. Amen. Living sacrifice wholly acceptable. Living sacrifice, holy, except if you will live holy or live sacrifice, you will be holy. And if you're holy, you will be acceptable. Yes, amen. amen. And when God accepts you, he will bless you. 
And then he gives us this command. He says, don't be like the world, but change your mind. All right, you will never cross the river of Jordan until you change your mind about the giants. You will never experience the milk and the honey until you change your mind about the problems. Got to get this. Joshua and Caleb were the only two that had the right mind. And their mindset was this. We are well able to go up and take the country. Their mindset was what the Lord is telling you and I. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Their mindset was, God said, therefore I do. God said, wherever we walk, he's already given it to us. God said, it's mine, not theirs. God said, we can take it. God said, we can do it. Therefore, my mind is in agreement with what God said. The other ten spies, they saw the same giants, the same walled cities, they saw the same problems, but their mind was different. So, my behavior is a product. My behavior, my actions, my deeds, my lifestyle, the things that I do is a product. It's the produce. It's the product of what I do with my mind. And what you do with your mind can be natural or it can be supernatural. You can try it in the natural, it'll work temporarily. But if you let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, your mind will empower you with a new behavior, a, life, a victorious lifestyle, and you'll be an overcomer in everything you put your hand to do. Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Everybody say, I, I am willing am to change my mind. Change my Let's stand together. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. <clears throat> I'm telling you that freedom is only a few steps away. Yes. You see, the children of Israel, when they crossed the Red Sea and they were free in the natural, they could have made a decision right then to be free permanently. That's right. Amen. Even though they were in the wilderness, they would have said, it doesn't matter what we're going through because God said doesn't matter about the wilderness because God said there's a promised land. God said that we're victorious. God said that it belongs to us. In the wilderness, they could have been saying it doesn't matter about Egypt anymore because God said. If they'd, get, if they'd gotten a, a God said mentality, they would have gone in and taken the land. But no, what do we do? We get involved in our problems. I'm going through this. I mean, everything is so wrong. I've been sick. The doctor said this and, and, uh, and my sister doing this to me and my dad did this to me and, and all the bank's telling me all this and everything and I'm, just, I'm hurting here and everything's going wrong. I'm losing my job. But God said... If God said that you are the head and not the tail, you are above and you are not beneath, then what God said, you need to change your mind to agree with. If God said you're blessed when you come in and you're blessed when you go out, you need to change your mind to agree with what God said. If God said you can go in and take the land, then just go on in there and do it and stop worrying about it. If God said it, that settles it. The only question is, do you believe it? And if you do, you get your mind changed. You focus on what God is saying and God is doing. You become that disciplined one. You're going to leave your past behind you and you're going to let the Holy Spirit stir up a new event. He's going to stir up a new event. Your new event may be healing for your body. Your new event may be some ministry somewhere where God's calling you to. Your new event may be your family being born again. Your new event may be some miracle you've been believing for, but God will stir up a new event in your spirit when you let go of your past events. But not until then. You can't go into the promised land when you're still worrying about Egypt.
Just close your eyes. Father, I just want to say thank you for your word. We want to be a part of the new event, Lord. We want freedom. We desire freedom. We don't want to remain where we are. We don't want to go back to where we've been. We desire freedom. Holy Spirit, I ask you to do the work that only you can do right now. Minister freedom. Hope. Hope. There's a new event taking place. There's a new event, Lord, that you're placing inside the spirit of someone in this room right now. There's a new event, Lord, that you're stirring up. There's something in the future that you're saying that we can acquire, we can have, we can hold on to. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for the new event. It's called freedom. Jesus. I don't want those of you that have been going.